several times a day. And if you'd like to have a decal, send a good address to Brother Woody and you can receive one of these and uh, he will send it to you. You can put it on your refrigerator and your, uh, or your car. Gentlemen, please remove your hats. Dear Heavenly Father, please pray for everyone here, our church, all the churches around us, our children, uh, trail life, and the girls, and also for my George. Amen. Good morning again, everybody. Uh, it's good to see everybody. Thank you, Margo, my personal prayer warrior. I want to thank everybody for coming out today. For those of you who are new, I am not Pastor Woody. He is uh, working in Mexico this morning, so uh, please pray for him to make sure that he doesn't overwork himself um, on the beach while he's uh, there digging in deep. Um, it's good to see everybody. We, I see we have kids, we have boys, we have girls. What a blessing. Uh, it's good to see you all. So we will have the Children's Church. Um, we're going to pray it up here in a minute, and then we'll uh, dispatch the children and get started. Um, as I have walked through the kitchen many times this morning, my sermon got shorter and shorter, so we'll see how far we get. <laughs> uh, Thanksgiving is probably one of my favorite meals of the year. Uh, or the week, or however often I can talk my beautiful wife into cooking me Thanksgiving. Um, so, gentlemen, if you'll remove your hats, we'll go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for allowing us to gather, Lord. We thank you for the kids that are here. We thank you for the parents and the adults. We just ask that you'll touch the hearts of each and every one of them, lift them up. We ask that you'll just be with our community, Lord. Touch the lives of the ones around here. We ask that I ask that you'll be with me, Lord, that you will use me to deliver the message you have given me, that you will not allow me to step into the way of it in any way, shape, or form, and that you will deliver this message through the Holy Spirit, Lord. We thank you for all the blessings you've laid upon us. We thank you for all the blessings that you will lay upon us, Lord. We just know that you're with us, and that without you, we would be and have nothing. So we thank you, Lord. Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, uh, boys and girls, if you will make your way to the back, y'all will be wrangled. Good luck, Deanne. <laughs> oh, glasses, I need glasses. It is a blessing to see children. I was, uh, I've not always been a, a kid person, uh, per se, but in, in dealing with, not dealing, in Serving with Trail Life, it has been a blessing to me. Um, I realized as a child I wasn't as messed up as I thought I was. Apparently I was just a little boy. Um, you know, we live in a world now to where if they're not sitting down and being quiet, they say something's wrong with them, and that's not true. Children are not meant to sit down and be quiet. They're meant to run. They're meant to get muddy. They're meant to, they're meant to do what kids do, and uh, we've been blessed in uh, the last few months watching these boys start coming together as a, a, a family. And uh, we're looking forward to the girls doing the same thing. We're really excited. Uh, when I started, uh, when I brought Trail Life to Pastor Woody, I wasn't sure uh, with us only having really one boy here every week what we were going to get. Uh, but I'm proud to say we've got 20 boys signed up. Um, and it is the community organization that we hoped it would be. Um, and anybody who wants to volunteer, see me after church. <laughs> and that's for the boys or the girls. We need, we need adults uh, who want to uh, mentor these children. Um, there's a lot of people out there in this world who are just dying to mentor our children. And these aren't people we want to mentor them. The people on TV, the people um, who don't believe what we believe. So it's important that uh, if you believe in God and you want to see our, our country get strong again and our world get strong again, that we, uh, we need to step up and start uh, teaching these uh, children about, uh, about God and uh, his grace and his mercy. Okay, so today, I would guess most of us here are Christians. I would guess most everybody online considers themselves Christians. 
Christians generally believe in God, know Jesus, and consider themselves good people. The problem in modern times is a lot of people who consider themselves Christians aren't really Christians. They're people who have good intentions. They're people who were taught they were Christians. But in reality, they don't have all of the properties isn't the word. They don't have all of the, uh, all the things that they need uh, to be Christian. Um, the Bible is very specific about what it takes to get into heaven. We have all heard about the narrow gate, the narrow way, and the narrow door. And Jesus, no matter how he stated it, narrow was a common theme. Uh, getting into heaven takes more than just coming to church a couple of times a year. And this is a harsh reality to some. Uh, many feel that when people start talking about what the Bible really says about salvation, uh, the word extremist is often used. Uh, and the further we go along in time, the more the people who actually believe in God and believe what his word says, they're considered more and more extremist and in some, some people's minds dangerous. Um, did you know the word Christian is only used in the te New Testament three times? Actually, it's only used in the whole Bible three times. Uh, in Acts 11.26, and he went, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So that, so it was that for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Now I've got a lot of. Uh, let me find a tissue. I'm sorry. I've got a lot of scriptures. Um, a lot of them we will not go to, but I've, they're going to put them up on the screen so y'all can reference them later on. Uh, Acts 26, verse 28. When Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuaded me to become a Christian. And then the third time is in 1 Peter. Uh, it's in chapter 4, verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this manner. The word Christian did not exist before Jesus ascended into heaven. In the earliest days of the church, the term Christian was not a term of endearment. Uh, it was given to followers of Christ as an insult. Christian, which means Christ-like, was given to the followers of Jesus by non-believers because they felt like they were acting like little, little messiahs. Uh, I think today we would call them sanctimonious. But again, when, when you believe what the Bible says and you try to act like what the Bible says, a lot of people uh, get offended, even in churches. Uh, Jesus did not tell his followers to go out and make Christians. He did not ask them to go out and make converts. He told his guys to go out into the world. He told them to go out and make disciples. In Matthew 19, I mean, in my, Matthew 28, 19, it says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, the word disciple is used over 250 times in the New Testament, and all of which are in the four Gospels, and in Acts, in the book of Acts. In the early church, you were a disciple before you were considered a Christian. So what is a disciple? Anyone who has been in church, watched preachers on TV, listened to Christian radio or podcasts, have probably heard the term. Merriam-Webster defines the a disciple as one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrine of another, such as, and the example they give is Christianity. One of the twelve in the inner circle of Christ's followers, according to the Gospels' accounts. And the Oxford Language Dictionary says, a personal follower of Jesus during his life, especially one of the twelve apostles. So it seems the world is calling an apostle and a disciple the same thing. And they are similar. And if we had time, we could go over it. But Pastor Woody has went over it many times. Um, so you can go back and watch that. Or when he gets back, he'll be happy to tell you. Uh, they are not the same. Because basically, in a nutshell, an apostle walked with Jesus. They were with him when he was on earth. They touched him, they ate with him, and they learned from him. A disciple of Jesus follows his teaching but was not with him, did not know him personally, and was not around when he was on earth. Uh, all disciples should interact with Jesus, but we interact on a spiritual basis through the Bible and prayer. Um, we are not physically going to see Jesus until he 
until we leave this earth and step into his presence or until he comes here and gets his church, um, which is getting closer every day. We don't know when that time is, but we do know every day gets us closer to that account. Um, but we can read God's word, study God's word, and we can pray. So basically, student is probably the best definition of what a disciple is. Disciples were to imitate, be imitators of their masters. So to be recognized as a disciple of your master, you had to learn his teachings and then pass it on to others. And then after you developed the learning, then the former disciples would become teachers themselves with their own disciples. And not all writers in the New Testament used the word disciple. Paul was one of them. He used language such as imitation and followers. In 1 Thessalonians 1, he said, And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Okay, I'll slow down. I know I'm going fast. I, I tend to talk fast. I'm sorry. And then in 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 14, it says, For you, brethren, for you, brethren, became imitators of the church of God, which are in Judea and Jesus Christ. And these are just two examples. There's a lot more in Paul's writings. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 11, chapter 11, verse 1, Paul directly said, Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. For Paul, to be an imitator of him was to be an imitator of Christ. His goal in life was to be like Christ in every way he could. He was not looking for his imitators to be an exact copy of him, but rather to be like Jesus. Many may think that Paul calling his followers to uh, be like him was arrogant, but really it was not. Rather, it reflects the notion of imitating some sort of moral example, which was quite common back in that time. It was him urging the modeling of the modeling of Christ. And those who had recently come to faith in Christ need both instructions and positive examples of how they live in their new faith, in what circumstances they live in. When you come to Christ, your life, or what surrounds your life doesn't change. So you have to be able to model after Christ in the same situation you were in the day before that you became to Christ in the months after that. Uh, Paul was striving to be an example that everybody could see. And I don't know about y'all, but me personally, I do better when I see a live physical example. Reading in a book doesn't always click with me. Um, I've watched a lot of uh, biblical accounts, I guess you could say. And one of my favorites was, and again, it's not a great video, but it is the book of Acts and it is nothing but scripture. They've added nothing. And it goes through the book of Acts from start to finish. And I got so much out of that, seeing the people interact while, ta while reading scripture, uh, it was really, really informative to me and helped me understand it better. I wish they would do that with more, but a lot of the um, scriptures don't interact very well, such as Acts does. Acts is an awesome book. A new Christian or disciple needs to have a good example so they can learn the behavior that they are to model. Because, again, whenever you're told something, that is a lot of times uh, your interpretation as you're being told. When you see it, it clicks a little bit more. Um, far too often, new believers are led to Christ. They answer the call. They accept the invitation. They say the prayer, they come to the altar, they fall to their knees, and they give their life to Christ. If it's a corporate worship gathering, like a church or a conference, everyone cheers, the pastor or the speaker congratulates them on their new life. They might be able to get a water baptism while they're there, depending on the event. They receive a pat on the back and a handshake and maybe even a hug. Someone in the back checks a box so the team can tell of the number of uh, people who gave their lives to Christ at their service or event, and everyone moves on except for the new Christian. They generally find themselves alone in the same life they were in the day before trying to figure out what's next. 
where to go, what to do. Most churches, conferences, and even good old-fashioned uh, um, tent revivals, that's the word I was looking for, uh, they're all about the challenge, the challenge of coming to Christ. There's a lot of talk about needing Jesus, uh, why you need to invite Jesus into your life. The gospel is laid out flawlessly usually, explaining what Jesus did, why he did it, why we need him. And at the end of the service or event, most Christians are hopefully at least handed a Bible, and they're told to read it, go to church, and everything will be fine. Really? Most people who are told to read a book start the book at the beginning. How many new believers do you think make it through the book of Genesis? And if they survive that, they still got to go through Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Anybody here who's read their Bible know that those are tough, tough books. So to help them understand, many partake in, the mod in some modern day technology. And the great thing about today's technology is everything you need to know is at a touch of a button. The bad thing about today's technology is a lot of what you don't need to know is at the touch of a button. There's so much false theology and bad answers out there, there's no guarantee if you don't know your Bible what you're going to get. Okay, I've kind of gotten away from the direction I was going. Originally, I, I felt the Lord uh, wanting me to talk about discipleship. But as I studied and gathered the information he was giving me, I realized that to properly talk about discipleship we need to make sure we know what being a disciple means. We hear Christian all the time, but we don't hear discipling that often anymore. Um, I was in the church learning for a number of years before I even knew exactly what it looked like to be discipled or to disciple. Um, fortunately, Pastor Woody has given me two Sundays. Um, so I have the ability, if the, Lord lead, if the Lord allows me to, today we're going to talk about being a disciple, and next week we'll talk about the actual discipleship. Uh, both are very, very important because you have to be a disciple to understand how to disciple. So if everyone will turn to Matthew chapter 10, verse 2. This is basically the, the, the scripture that I've kind of worked off of, though you'll see I have a lot. Actually, you can see I have a lot. I want to make sure everybody knows how to turn the pages in their Bible. It's very important. Get your, get your work out this morning. All right, so we, co we covered the definition of the disciples, and Jesus did have 12 core disciples, which, of course, were the apostles. So in Matthew 10, we're going to be in verse 2. Now, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, his brother, his aunt, uh, and his, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of uh, Alphaeus, and this isn't J uh, James, Jesus' half-brother, this is someone else, another James, uh, and Lebius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. And Jesus sent them out to teach, preach, and heal. Now, I will say on this, when I talk about visual, if, if you haven't watched The Chosen, it's not verse per verse, but seeing these people actually moving around has helped me understand who these people were and what they did. Because really, even if you, you, you read the Bible a lot, generally speaking, you know the big four. John, James, Matthew, and uh, who was the fourth one? Luke, yes, thank you. Uh, and Luke actually uh, wasn't even an apostle. He was uh, a Gentile who was a... I think a friend of Paul's, but he was, he was very, very involved in doing the, uh, the New Testament, as we know, because he wrote the Gospel of Luke and he wrote uh, the book of Acts. And then, of course, there was Saul, who became Paul, and Matthias, who nobody hardly ever talks about, um, who was chosen after Judas betrayed Jesus. Um, and there's really not, a, there's really only that he was, Matthias, I'm talking about, uh, he, was, he became an apostle, um, and what study I did at one point, 
really all that they talk about was he went into the Far East or the Far East and he was uh, eventually martyred. He was a great, great teacher of, of Christ. Uh, to, be called a, to be called a disciple, you must know what disciple means. If you are a follower of Christ, someone who is all in on Christ, then you are considered a disciple. We're almost 2,000 years from when Jesus was here on earth teaching the apostles. And since there's no evidence that any of the apostles made it to the third century, much less to 2022, we don't have them to teach us. But we do have their wor God's word. This is the, what God has given us as a guide to know him, to know his son, and to know what's coming uh, in the last chapter. As I had commented to somebody before, if you want to know the, the good news of the Bible, read the book of Revelation, the last chapter. My mother was one of those. She'd go to a bookstore and she'd open every book that she thought about reading and start with the last chapter. I thought it just ruined everything. But, you know, if you want to know if it's going to be a good book, you see how it's going to end. Once we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit comes and lives within us. He is our helper. He is God's representative of us. He also is there to teach us and lead us. The only problem is a lot of new believers, they don't know how, what to listen for. They don't know how to hear the Holy Spirit speak to us. There's so much noise in the world that sometimes we need help. And to follow the Holy Spirit, sometimes you need outside help. As the Ethiopian said to Philip when he asked, do you understand what you are reading? And that's in Acts chapter 8, verse 30 and 31. The Ethiopian responded, how can I unless someone guides me? And that is important that we are guided to ensure that what we are receiving is from God. As I said earlier, when Paul, when I was talking about Paul and his followers imitating him, having a live-action model, model is an example to help, that helps tremendously. As we walk with our Lord, do you have someone you're discipling? Do you have someone discipling you? The late Steve Farr, he's a great men's ministry man that I, listen to, I have listened to for years. Um, his podcast and, and a lot of his sermons are still online, and, and for men especially it is a great great he, he was a great great leader in that area of men's ministry um, what he said was we should always be under the discipleship of someone more mature of us but we should also be discipling someone less mature than us we should be in a constant state of discipleship both giving and receiving a disciple is transformed by Christ they become a new creation and we must remember that when you give your life to Christ, the next morning you're not going to wake up a totally different person. God has the ability to change us that quickly. He can touch us and turn us into something that we're not. But that rarely happens. It's hard to appreciate what God has done for you if you don't have to work for it. It's like people and money. If you don't have to work for it, you don't usually appreciate it. And it's kind of the same way as you need to understand all that God has done for you. But if you're truly transformed, you begin to see and feel a difference in your wants, in your desires, in the way you talk, and in the way you interact with people. Now many, once they become uh, followers of Christ, they do the bare minimum, just wanting to get by and, and sneak into heaven. Uh, they continue in the perpetual sin that they were doing before they found Christ, all the while wondering why nothing has changed. We must abide in Jesus for him to make the changes in us. John 8, 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And to abide in, in Christ is to allow his word to fill our minds, direct our wills, and transform our, our affections. We are no longer the person we were before Jesus. People will tell you how the things you used to do and, and how that you can never change. But if you truly have Jesus and you truly learn from his word and walk in his ways, you will change. He can change anybody. A disciple lives a God-centered life. They strive to live like Jesus, 
talk like Jesus and act like Jesus. And this is important because I personally believe when you're in your walk, your testimony to other people is more effective in the way you live than the way you talk. Because people can tell you anything. And we have a whole town up in the Northeast that that's what they do. They tell us every day what we want to hear, but they don't, they don't produce. So it's very important that you understand that how you live, it's not do as I say, not as I do, it's do as I do. Because that's where people truly discover if God is in you or not. And we are to focus on God and Jesus. We are to learn the scriptures so we will know their attributes. We're to learn the scriptures so we know the truths from the lies. This book is full of truth. And anything that goes against this book is a lie. We are also to look to those discipling us. We're to ask the Holy Spirit for discernment and, and wisdom to lead us through the teachings we are being taught. To ensure that they are of him. A disciple wants to know Jesus' teaching. If you're a true disciple of Christ, you hunger for his word. You want to be in his word at all times. We should study God's word so we know if a false teacher is trying to mislead us. And we must know Jesus' teaching so that we may teach the less mature upon us in the faith. We can't model or teach what we do not know. A true disciple is not, sinner, is not the center of his own life or their own life. Jesus is. Everything revolves around giving God glory. A true disciple does not point to themselves. They understand that without Jesus, they can do nothing. They do not want those around them to see them. They want those around them to see Jesus and know that Jesus is the one who's leading them through it. A disciple is called to be holy. Pursue peace with all people and holiness without which no one will see the Lord. That's Hebrews 12, 14. And this one is probably one of the toughest things when you start talking about it. This is one of the things that even in a lot of the modern churches, when you start talking about becoming holy, you hear words like sanctimonious and self-righteous. Um, these are just a few words uh, that can be used when people start describing about being holy. And one of the big things is, who are you to tell me? But we all are human. None of us are perfect. We all follow Christ and we all try to be as close to him as we can but until we leave this earth we're all going to have sin no matter how hard we fight against it we are all going to have sin but the question is do you freely sin and, and, and live in perpetual sin the sin continues every day but holiness is something that you need to go through the narrow gate there's verses in the Bible that make you go, hmm. And then there's those verses that make you wonder if you'll ever be able to get into heaven. And the Bible is full of those verses. And, and, and if you truly dig into the Bible, most people will struggle because there are places. I'm, I'm doing First John for RCC TV, and John says flat out, if you know Jesus, you do not sin. That's a tough one, especially when we all know that if you are human, which we are, and you're not Jesus, which we're not, you're going to sin. Uh, let's turn over to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 is where we're going to start in it. It is not only the extremists who should seek to be holy, but everyone seeking to get into heaven should seek to be holy. Ephesians 1, chapter 3. I should have marked my Bible. 1 verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. To come before 
a holy God, you must be holy. And how do you become holy? Let's go to Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. Just two books over. How many here feel they have the ability to become holy on their own? Good, I'm glad I didn't see any hands. All right, so Colossians, uh, Colossians uh, chapter 1, verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him, that's in Jesus, all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. And you, who once were alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. Jesus' death on the cross. That's the only way we become holy. There is no other way. We cannot become, come before a holy God in our natural sinful state. That is why Jesus had to come to earth. No matter how hard we may try to follow the law, we cannot. We cannot do nothing to save ourselves. We cannot make ourselves holy. That is why Jesus had to die. Excuse me. His, his spotless sin-free sin free blood had to be shed to wash away our sins. We have to be covered in his blood to stand before a holy God. And it's free. It costs us nothing. Except for as one person I heard said, it costs us our sin. And a lot of times that's why a lot of people do not come to Jesus because they're afraid if they give up their sin, they will give up the fun of the life they're living. And once you're out of the sin, you see that it may have been fun in a moment, but the consequences of that sin that you did not see while you were in it affects more than just you. It affects everybody around you. All we have to do is believe. Lay everything at the feet of Jesus and ask for forgiveness. Repent of the sins that we have been that have been controlling our lives and immerse ourselves in the love of Jesus. Of the, the love of God and the love of the Holy Spirit. If we can't get holiness right, we can't get anything right. Everything we do is based around our love for Jesus. We can't work our way into heaven, but your love for Jesus should cause you to want to work for Jesus, to spread the word, to talk to people, to do the things that we're called to do. A disciple does not go it alone or sit at home avoiding other believers. We are called to have our own uh, personal time with Jesus. Alone time in our prayer closet, as a lot of people call it, we should have that one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus. But we're also called to participate in corporate worship like we do here. Pastor Woody speaks of Hebrews uh, chapter 10, verse 24 and 25 all the time. And I know you all all have heard it. Let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. Now let's go to Colossians 3, chapter 3, verse 14. It should be over a, maybe two pages, depending on your Bible. We are called to worship and fellowship with other believers. We are called to worship as the body of Christ. Colossians 3, chapter 3, verse 14. But above all these things put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing, admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts of the Lord. You do not have to go to a megachurch. You don't have to come to a congregation like this. But you must gather with others. The early church gathered in homes. But you should always gather with people outside of your immediate family. We are to invest in each other. Teach each other. We're to hold each other accountable to each other. We must have godly people speaking into our lives. And with permission, we should also speak into other people's lives. But we should have permission. If you haven't given permission, don't be telling people all the bad things they're doing. That's, that, that's a good way to, to, to go wrong in that area. Um, and also, we have to remember that men need men. One told you about Jesus. And you might not have been a bad person. I didn't think I was. I was better than that other guy. So, you know. You know, as long as there's somebody over here who's worse. But somebody told you about Jesus. Um, someone prayed that your, soul will be so, that your soul would be saved. We have to remember that. Because we're not born followers of Jesus. We're born enemies. And until we realize what he has done for us, we can't truly come to him and uh, worship him. It's easy to think of him as uh, Santa, that when I'm having a bad day, hey, will you help me, Lord? But when you're having a good day, you don't think about him. And we should think about him at all times because we will have peaks and valleys. That's just part of, part of it. Um, but if we don't appreciate him up here, it's hard to appreciate him down here. And I think most of us have been there. Um, prepare. I had a man tell me one time that uh, in the good times, you better be praying for the bad times. Because God didn't say if they would come, but he said they would come. But again, you know, as long as you, it, 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 as long as you know this last book, we win. And our goal is to take as many as, as the old bad part of it was, is, you know, I'm going to take as many people out as I can. Well, our goal is to take as many people out to Christ with us. We are to talk to them. Um, we can't change their soul. We can't change their mind. But we can give them the gospel, give them the good news, and allow, them to, uh, allow Jesus to do his work because that's what he does. Jesus saves. All right, that food smells really good. Um, but it is, it is uh, and, I, and I joke about that, but I mean it is important that we know that no matter what we do, God is the one who does it all. But we are his hands and feet because we are the Bible and we are here to, to, to tell people and let them know that somebody loves them, even the, even the people who feel like they're unlovable. So gentlemen, if you will remove your hat we will go to the Lord in prayer once again. Dear Lord, we just, we thank you. We thank you for this message. Um, not all of your messages are easy. Uh, it's not easy to put together. It's not easy to deliver. And it's not easy to hear. But I thank you for these messages. These are the messages that help us to realize that no matter what, you are here with us. You will lift us up, Lord, and you will... You will use us as your tool to touch other people's lives. And that is your will, that we will reach these other people. I thank you, Lord, for allowing us to gather like this. I thank you for giving us such a wonderful day, wonderful building, such a, such a wonderful congregation. I thank you for the people who are outside, who are watching this, uh, either today or in the future. I pray that the, you will touch their hearts in a way. I pray that they will see you and not me, Lord. This message isn't about me. It's not about the people here. It's all about you. We thank you, Lord, that you, you have brought us together, and we just pray that anyone who does not know you will come to you today. We ask that, that if, if they don't truly know you and they're not sure where they're at, that they will 
lift up their eyes to you, Lord, that you will touch their hearts and that you will show them that you are the only way. I ask that anybody who wants to know, who, who wants to come to the Lord, who, who has decided that, that this is the way they want to live, that they want to become a disciple, that they want to touch other people's lives while God is touching theirs, I ask that you'll repeat this prayer. And you must mean it in your heart. You must truly, truly mean it for it to, to, for God to hear it. Dear Lord, I know that I am a sinner and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins, invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, I pray all these things. Amen. And if you have made that decision, I ask that you'll come talk to me or whenever Woody's here, talk to him. Because it is true that in many cases we talk about it. We talk about coming to the Lord. We talk about all the things we need to do.